and welcome to the Doofcast, the official variety podcast of doofmedia.com. My name is Scott Daly, and coming at you live from his panic room in Denver, Colorado, is my co-host, Matt. How's it going, Scott? We're doing good in here. We've got food. We've got water. We're fully prepared for COVID-19. The important thing is nobody panics. Panic room out. <laughs> well, that's good to hear, Matt, because this week on the show, it is another one of our Deconstructing Director series, diving deep into the films of David Fincher. This week is film number five in the Fincher series. I can't believe we're already on film number five, Matt. It's kind of crazy. And we're talking about 2002's Panic Room, and that's all we're doing this week, Matt. We're just we got I think we got a lot to say about this uh, this movie, and we're just going to devote the entire episode to it. Um, and I think it's going to be an interesting conversation. Yeah, I, I um, people are going to have a lot to say about this, especially, you know, now that, now that we're on number five of the Fincher films, it's, um, you know, there's increasingly more to say about him as a director. The more films that we have to process, you can draw more and more connections between them. Yeah, I mean, definitely. That's definitely true. Um, and this is this is an interesting film, and I kind of want to talk about it as like a point in Fincher's career as well, because um, it's not the type of film he normally makes in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a good conversation, full spoilers conversation for Panic Room. Go see that movie if you haven't, and then come back and listen to this. Or, you know, spoil yourself. Go crazy. All right, let's talk about Panic Room. It's called a Panic Room. What? A safe room. Castle keep in medieval times. Fort concrete walls, buried phone line not connected to the house's main line. You have your own ventilation system and a bank of surveillance monitors that covers nearly every corner of the house. Oh, what's to keep someone from prying open the door? Steel. Very thick steel. My room. Definitely my room. So, Matt, what is Panic Room? Uh, Panic Room is the story of a divorced woman and her diabetic daughter taking refuge in their newly purchased house's safe room when three men break in searching for a missing fortune. That is very true. This was a film that was written by David. Oh, I looked up how to pronounce his last name before we started, and I forgot. David Kopp. Kep. I think it's Kep. David Kep. Yeah, that sounds right. David Kep is the yeah. writer. It was written by David Kep and, of course, directed by David Fincher. Um, it came out in 2002 and stars Jodie Foster, Forrest Whitaker, and a, a, little, a little baby Kristen Stewart. A little, yeah. A little baby. Adorable. Also, future Academy Award winner Jared Leto is in this movie. <laughs> uh yeah doing yeah, what is. doing what he does best uh -huh. playing a playing an annoying smarmy asshole just being super super irritating yeah yeah so like i said this is a very interesting movie um in, in fitcher's filmography if just that if the films of david fitcher were a tv series this would be the bottle episode one, right <laughs> this is a one location pretty much shoot um I think there's like there's like two exterior shots, but everything else takes place inside this house and the kind of just the, the street around it. Um, so not too many sets, not too many characters. It's pretty it's pretty scaled back film. Um, and yet Fitcher still manages to like fancy the shit out of it, <laughs> which Absolutely. is the craziest thing about this movie. Yeah, I mean, the, the house is the entire world of this movie. You're right. right. There's, there's a few exterior moments, but. We, the, the being trapped in this in this house with this very interesting layout, this multi-story, you know, narrow, very tall and narrow brownstone. Oh, it's so good. Um, it's it's dark, it's moody. Um, you know, it's it's kind of, it's kind of old. So so everything has this. Uh, just the atmosphere is fantastic. I think this is for for whatever reason. I mean, we've talked over and over about kind of the, how atmospheric his movies are, how, how like the feeling of them, how it's always kind of like either dirty or grungy or, mm -hmm. or oppressive. And this, this movie, it's not, it's not that it's dirty and grungy. The house is, is well kept. It's just, it's just a bit old. Yeah. Um, but it still has this feeling of, of being, you know, closed in. And one thing I noticed this time is that like just the, the lighting is just perfect in every shot because it's dark, right? It's, it's dark in the house for most of this movie. And then mm -hmm. sometimes there are light sources, but just like the, the perfection of, of the lighting to sort of maintain uh, a sense of color and dynamism and, and a sense of where things are, but still a sense that everything is very dark and oppressive. And, and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of shadows and a lot of black to the picture, but, but yet, yet it's still very clear to you at all times. Yeah. 
I think that's yeah. kind of a superpower of Fincher's or, or whoever it is that's in charge of that aspect of the filmmaking that Fincher works with. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely lighting is cinematography. So that's his DP. But he's also like the one he's their boss. Right. So he's right. making like they're doing their work, but he's the one telling them what he wants. And actually, the funny thing about this movie is it actually has two directors of photography mm-hmm. as a person named Conrad Hall and Darius Kanji, um, which is interesting because you don't see that too often. Um, Darius was actually the DP on seven as well, um, which I think gets a lot of the moodiness right you know um actually sure. both of both of these well no um conrad was on seven but he was camera and electrical so he worked mm. for the dp so here are their co-directors of photography on this movie yeah and yeah like i, I was kind of being a little tongue-in-cheek with the bottle episode thing i mean the idea of a bottle episode is it's like a cheap easier to make episode in the middle of your season when you're low on budget right but i think this is what a david fincher bottle episode would look like like yeah. If you if you hand that idea to David Fincher, this is the type of movie he's going to make. This movie cost 50 million dollars still somehow. Um, and it's because he goes crazy with it as far as what you said, the lighting, the look of the place, how he shoots this house, um, the use of like CG camera moves um, to help get places and see the geography of this house that, uh, you know, a, a, a physical camera might not be able to do. Yeah, that's something that's easy to not even notice. But like there's so many times where. The camera either passes like up vertically through several floors yeah. in an impossible way or, or the one shot where it like zooms across the house and like goes through the handle of a coffee pot. Mm-hmm. And I, I, honestly, I'm curious how they did stuff like that because it it's it's sort of like joining up to live shots with people in them with these swooping, obviously CGI, um, um, you know, bridges. And I, I actually don't know how they do that. It's, it's yeah. pretty cool, especially for that. You know, th- this is this is not a not a new movie, um, and at no point do you really notice that it's CGI. No, you don't. I mean, I think there's there's a little bit of a sheen to some of the like. I think there are moments when the camera moves in such a way that it's so smooth that I was like, oh, this is probably digital. But yeah. like that's that's me kind of on the lookout for it. I think especially for 2002, I think you're right. It's pretty damn seamless um, and, and really impressive. And I think that's that's kind of where. I want to start with you is this house because I think what this movie does with getting you to understand the geography of this house is incredible. Um, And the way Fincher kind of does it is really smart because the movie opens on the, the realtor tour of the house. So the, the two characters, we meet our two characters, mother and daughter, and they go into the house and it's completely empty and gutted, but the realtor is walking them through the house floor by floor, room by room. And like, it's, it's really early in the movie. So I don't think like, like a normal moviegoer is like paying super, super close attention to where they're like, okay, I know I'm going to need to know this later. I'm mapping all this stuff. Um, but it just gives you a feeling of what it looks like. Like you see them walk, th- like the house is very interestingly laid out because there's always like two ways to get to the same place. Um, like there's, there's a, a the main like staircase that has a banister around it, but also each and every one of the rooms connects to each other outside of the main hallway right. as well. And then, of course, there's the elevator, which becomes important. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a very, it's a very cleverly laid out um, house. It, it's funny because I, I guess I could have looked this up, perhaps, but uh, <laughs> just, just I don't, I don't know if they is this house a set? Like, is this a real house, or did they just build like a hundred different sets uh, to <laughs> to sort of approximate a house? Because um, it's it, it, it's almost. Like I've never been to one of the brownstones in New York, but like it just seems so oppressive and narrow and uncomfortable that it's hard for me to believe this this could even be a real house. But maybe it is. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I, I, I looked it up as you were talking. It was completely constructed. Okay. Um, the house was built on a soundstage. It cost six million dollars to build. Wow. Um, they built the entire house. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's why it feels like, cause it's not, it's not just a bunch of various soundstage. It looks like they, I mean, maybe they didn't layer them on top of each other, but I, no, maybe they did because there's a lot of shots that Fincher does where you see up and down the staircase where people are looking at each other from one floor to the other and the camera is tracking that whole movement. Sure. So I think they probably did build it on top of each other. Yeah, I think so. And, and I mean, I think one of my favorite, um, motifs in the movie is actually the security cameras, 
um, where so many times in the movie you're you're tracking at, at first you're tracking what the bad guys are doing going around the house via the security cameras and there are parts where you know we're we're just inside the panic room we're not really following them and all we can see is through the security cameras and then it's flipped where Jodie Foster is running around outside and we're following her with the security cameras and all of that for, for whatever reason the security cameras gave me this much more cohesive sense of how everything fits together um, yeah yeah well i mean that was uh, cool i think i think it's like at some point in the development fincher and his team realized that the geography of this house was complex and confusing and so they made sure that through mo- multiple times throughout the course of the, f- the film they're going to reinforce the layout of the house they're going to the, it seemed like a specific goal that we do not want people to feel lost in this house unless it's like a specific moment that the script calls for like where are they i don't know um but mostly it continually reasserts where everyone is and where the rooms are located and all that stuff like talking about the the digital shots like the big the big like incredibly impressive shot is when the guys first show up to the house yeah. and we're upstairs in the bed with Jodie Foster and the camera leaves her behind and goes out to the main hallway and, and like drops down through the floor and zooms over to the front door and we see them standing there. And it's like the camera never leaves the house really. Like it's sticking in the house um, and watching these guys approach the house from the outside. And then Forrest Whitaker like tries the back door and the camera sh- zooms through the house to follow him. And then he tries the, the second front door because this is like a crazy these brownstones are crazy yeah um and then eventually he goes up to the roof to try the roof access and the camera follows all the way up there um and it's just like kind of like this feeling of of each and every entrance being prodded but that really helps again reinforce the layout of the house here's where the doors are here's where the exit is here's where the room is compared to where they're coming in etc 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 and i think it's really cool yeah, absolutely. I think that, that that's one of the things that it does to set up your understanding. Another thing it does is just has multiple scenes where there's kind of no point to them other than um, show you this part of the house and then have have it be tense. You know what I mean? Like, like, sure. like for example, when she when she wakes up in the night and she's walking around and she goes to the bathroom um, and they're in the house already and she doesn't realize it. Um, it, it, that's just sort of a scene of her going to different rooms and giving you the layout of the area around her bedroom, Mm -hmm. which is one of the more important parts of the house. I would say like the first floor and the floor with her bedroom on it are the two most important parts to get straight every other floor. It's just kind of, yeah, I mean, whatever that there's not, there's not a lot that, that happens on those floors. Um, but they, they make really sure that you understand those two floors for sure. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, and the other thing that I really liked about it, um, is the way, I mean, this, this is, it's a pretty simple script. Um, characters don't really talk about the way they feel very often in this movie, but like the story of this parent child relationship is so present in every directorial choice, right? The thing, like the thing that I really grabbed on, gripped onto this, this, this time watching it is there's this moment at the very, very beginning where they walk into the house and Kristen Stewart, Stewart's character is on her scooter. Um, and she's scootering around the house and Jodie Foster is like, please, please don't do that. Don't do that. And she's just ignoring her. And then the realtor is like, like snaps at her and she immediately stops. And it's this really simple and elegant way to reinforce that this mother doesn't like doesn't seem to have the respect of her kid, um, that their relationship is strained and she's not comfortable like disciplining her in the way that she needs to. Um, it's just this really quick thing that that sets up this entire relationship between mother and daughter, just bam, like that. Yeah, I think I think you're right. It's funny because I I may be about to sound like I'm contradicting what you just said, although I, I think you're right, that is what that scene does. But what I was gonna say about the relationship is that it it read very, very different to me than it did the first time I saw this movie. And I think I probably watched this movie a couple times, you know, less than a, less than a handful of times, years and years ago, probably 10 years ago was the last time I saw this movie before I had kids mm-hmm. was, was the, the, the last time I saw this movie. And, um, and I, and I, I think maybe I, maybe even the first time I saw it, I was close enough to, um, Kristen Stewart's age that I like, 
thought of her as an annoying twerp because she was <laughs> l- l- like, you know what I mean? Like, like instead of instead of being able to look at her as like a little baby like I do now, I looked at her as like a peer and thus didn't see her kind of the way the movie wants you to. Huh. If that makes sense. Um, yeah, but yeah. but but now, like, it's interesting because the parent and, and I think when I was younger, I read it. As, I read the movie as like, oh, um, they have a terrible relationship and and she's and she's really ter- she's really mean and rude to her mom. And this this viewing, I was like, no, th- they don't have a terrible relationship. Um, they go out of their way to be kind to each other. Like the, when they're having the pizza, like there's a there's a bit of like performative terseness from Kirsten Stewart. Am I saying the right name? Kristen. Kristen Stewart. But but then like she clearly cares about the fact that her mom is upset and like th- there's 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 obvious there's obvious love between them it's just yeah. also um there there is a there's a frustration and a and and they're both i think it's actually actually my reading this time is more like they're both struggling with this divorce thing and th- but they're not really struggling together they're sort of struggling right. separately and and not and, and neither of them really have the emotional capacity to help the other with what they're going through but yeah. they're kind of doing their best and there's, there's a distance between them there's distance between them but it's not like oh they, they oh they have a terrible relationship and the movie fixes their relationship it's it's really more like they they, they their relationship is under strain and uh I, I don't know it's i thought it was i thought it was interesting because it was just very very different to me this time through yeah i mean i don't i don't disagree with anything you're saying there i i think i think there, there's that one scene where she you can like they're both they're both suffering and they're both angry at their husband slash father and they are not coexisting in that anger you're absolutely right because there's that beautiful moment where kristen stewart is like fuck him and jodie foster's like don't do that and then is like fuck her too and she's like yes but don't do that it's like Uh they're not they're not uh, and i think part of it is jodie foster is trying to put up this this front for her daughter i mean the one moment we see her break down is when she's alone in the bath and she just kind of loses it and starts weeping because she's having a really tough time with this. Her husband's cheating on her with a younger woman and broke up the marriage and she's on here on her own. And I think the house, you know, is is the setting of this place, but it is the perfect encapsulation of her life. It, it's it's huge. Yeah. It's like way too big for the two of them. Like this is like the most fucking massive Manhattan t- townhome you will ever see ever. Like it, I, I, I think it's just like when I first saw this movie, I didn't quite understand how fucking expensive and rare this thing must be. Right. It, it must have cost like a hundred million dollars. Like it, it's like, okay, maybe not that much, but like it's, it's millions an, and millions of dollars. Yeah. For sure. it's, it's enormous. Like there are like three floors. It's these things do not exist in Manhattan, um, especially, especially Central Park West. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> it's like the most expensive right. real estate. Um, but so, but so they, they, these, they got this huge, massive house, way more space than they need, like to the point where she's living on the second floor and her daughter is living on the third floor. I mean, they are not even on the same level, both literally and metaphorically. Right. So there, there is that distance between there is that separation between them. And the end of the movie then becomes this really important symbol of they're sitting on a park bench her her daughter's head is resting in her lap they are together and they are searching for another place um that is much smaller um and much yeah. less absurd and and ginormous like this place without yeah. without a panic room it's it's delightful i love mm-hmm. that part yeah just uh, one one moment about that the, the the pizza the pizza scene is that after she's after she says you know fuck her too and then jodie foster says you know i agree but don't like like the daughter looks a little bit chastened and th- but then just before that Jodie Foster had kind of told her like all right no more coke like she 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 pulls the coke bottle away and then she takes the coke bottle and she like refills her daughter's yeah. drink with coke and, and so it's like this little this little gift for 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 trying um even though even though she disapproved she's like look i i dis- I, I don't want you to say those things but i i really appreciate that you're that you're trying to help me here but yeah it, it's just a, i mean I, I I love moments like that. That the movie has a lot of um, nonverbal um, moments that that are that are subtle that are communicating things between characters. I, yeah. I don't know. Uh, those are prob a lot of those are probably in the script. I think that's that's the kind of thing that might be in the script because it seems important to the progression of the scene. But um, just I overall, mean, I like that kind of thing. 
I think they some of them are. I think the thing like the Coke, maybe not like, but I do think like even if they are written in the script, the way Fincher captures them, I think says a lot. Um, the way the way she like when we meet Jodie Foster, like the way she is around her daughter is so like and and yeah, I, I, they have a they have a good relationship. I don't think this this movie is about a woman realizing she loves her daughter. Like right. that's that's not it at all. It's a woman like being able to like remove the distance between her and her daughter. Um, but just the way they the, the, those performances, like how guarded she is, like she's not she doesn't yell. She doesn't get a motive. She's just like kind of closed off in a certain way. It's like she put herself in her own personal panic room and right. not letting herself out. Um, yeah. I mean, she's, she's, um, um, it seems like she gets railroaded into buying the house. Like it seems like she's very uncertain of herself and yeah. she's just kind of getting, she's, uh, um, easily pushed around at this point just because her confidence has been shattered. Like, yeah. like she can't yeah. really stand up to her daughter she can't really stand up to this realtor who's telling her like, you have to put a, an offer on this giant, giant house that you don't actually need. Yeah. So, well, and, and there's this, there's this little hint of, of stuff that like, she's probably, she's married to this rich guy who's like massively, massively wealthy. And so everyone looks at her as just the wife of the dude. And we yeah. get these little hints of she's going to go back to school. Um, and the movie like systematically shows her as incredibly resourceful, incredibly intelligent, like so good at problem solving. I mean, just like the at every at every turn, she outsmarts these people, especially the security guy that's like that's been doing this for years and knows exactly how to deal with this stuff. Like they are in this, like this cat and mouse game, this chess match and she is playing wonderfully. And so yeah. like, it's, it's, I think on the one hand showing us that this woman is super competent, but her, her showing herself that she has the strength, this innate strength to her to take care of her kid, because it is not her husband that comes in and saves the day. He is entirely ineffectual in that. He doesn't accomplish that at all. Completely useless. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if anything, he just creates obstacles that she has to deal with. And then and she's able to use him as part of a trap later mm -hmm. um, as a practically inanimate object. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, mean I, I think the movie is doing that on purpose by having him like, come in let like a doofus and immediately get his ass kicked <laughs> yeah like like severely and then and then be like a coward for the rest of the movie um and then and then finally his function at the end is like to kind of help but also mainly to just serve as a way of like the daughter is very worried about him and it kind of looks at her at her mom and her mom is like it's okay you know yeah like, yeah like it's your dad like like he's 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 your dad. We're not. It, I, I yeah. I thought that was yeah. a it was a very very subtle moment at the end there. Sure. I mean, and I think it connects back to the pizza scene that we're continually going back to when like it, it's got to be this complicated thing in divorce when you're so angry at this person that's hurt you so bad, but it is it is your parent. It is your kid's parent, and so like. Right you don't want them to hate their parent, um, and but you don't know how to communicate that to them because you're so fucking angry. So right. like, I, I think that's, that's, and, and the, the movie never comes out and spells any of that out. It's just through Fincher's direction. It's just through the way he constructs these scenes and the way they play out. Yeah. There's a huge amount of this movie is in the performances. I mean, we've mm -hmm. talked about Jodie Foster and her character quite a bit. Oh, she's so um, good. We oh could God. go through pretty much everybody. I mean, Forrest Whitaker is basically half of this movie. Yeah. yeah. Like the, the, the idea that, you know, this movie with a different script where none of the burglars were sympathetic would be a very different movie. Yeah. And him being the sympathetic burglar who you you just love him and you you don't want him to get caught like like i know i couldn't believe that at the very end there when he's climbing over the fence i was like yeah get oh yeah. i forgot that he gets caught in the end and yeah. i was like oh man i really wanted to see him get away yeah i almost like i i i, I literally um every time i end this movie i'm like oh i wish i i wish there was a scene where we saw like jody foster uh uh, uh testifying that that he actually like saved them at the end and i was like yeah uh, and then I was like, that's kind of weird that I, that I want that. But like he's, I mean, F Forrest Whitaker is such a lovable, he, he portrays being lovable so well and like everything he's in. Um, it's just a quality of his, I think it, it, it's a charisma that he has as an actor and, and he brings that to this role and, and he doesn't really say much. Um, 
well, I, I mean, he's, yeah, I guess he says that m- mostly, I, I guess, I guess what's fun about the movie, this is what I was saying kind of rolls into this, which, which is that like, what's fun about the movie is it's, there's all this character drama stuff that we've been talking about and all this mm-hmm. atmosphere and so forth. But like, also it's like a fun, intricate, clever um, cat and mouse game. Yeah. Where it's, like a, it's like a Hitchcock film kind of. It's a lot like a Hitchcock film where, where like the details actually matter quite a lot. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and the power dynamic goes back and forth a couple of times. Like, like there's, there's whole parts where they're just like talking. They're, they're like, okay, she's in there, but did you, you know, did you get the phone line in the basement? And, and, and like, okay, so it, like, like just talking out the ramifications of, of the situation and, and trying to reason it out with each other. And then, and then like, the you know there's the, the shifting power dynamics within the the crew of of robbers as they mm-hmm. realize that Jared Leto has been lying to them, and then obviously they get trapped in the panic room and they have her daughter and then she eventually yeah it, it's it's just yeah I, I think Hitchcock is a great comparison actually this, mm-hmm. the the feeling of it and the the constant shifting interactions and yeah it's great and like you said the power balance shifting like i i I love that within within the crew of robbers there's this constant shift of power balance that it goes from from leto to um to raul yeah (laughs) and then lastly to forrest whitaker as he kind of finally takes control and then shoots the dude in the head um but then you're absolutely right that the the whole movie kind of turns on itself at some point, and then it's the bad guys that are locked in the panic room and and Foster outside plotting and planning and trying to get them out. Um, I, I think it's so wonderful how like it, it like you would think this is a movie in which a woman and her daughter hide in a panic room and the bad guys want to get her out, and like how how do you how do you do that for the what I think it was a, like a hundred minute runtime? How do you yeah. do that? And you do it by constantly changing things up. Like I, I think the, the the script, like getting outside of Fincher's direction, which is just excellent, but the script I think is really clever in in how it continues to like shift and raise the tensions and the stakes. Like we go from one problem to the other, and there's always a reason for Jodie Foster to try to ha- to get out of the room. Yeah. Um, and then the way the the bad guys use that and manipulate her in that in some regards, it's just consistently clever. Yeah. And, and just, I think everything is that they thought of everything. Like, mm-hmm. like it, it's actually think about how often you see a movie and, and I know you and I aren't the type to pick at things and, and nitpick and, and it, like, unless there's just something egregious, we'll just kind of be like, whatever that, that like, like you could just be like, well, the conceit of the movie is that they're trapped in the house. And so, um, and so it's fine if they don't try to communicate with anyone outside. But the thing is, they try multiple times to communicate with people outside. And there's always a very believable and and within story acceptable reason why it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and then also they went they took the extra step of making this like heavy, windy rainstorm outside where there's all this just like background noise. Yeah. So yeah. that you could believe that, um, first of all, she wouldn't hear them entering the house and then nobody else can hear yeah, or, or nobody recognizes, you know, that, that all this shit is happening um, in their house. Yeah, yeah. And it all it, it just it all tracks perfectly. Like, I've, I've never really heard anyone be like, oh, the major plot hole in this movie. Yeah. Um, no. Which, you know, obviously that's just, like I think we had a lot of complaints about um, the game and z- zero, zero similar complaints for this movie. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it is definitely much, much, much less complex of a setup. But yeah, I mean, I think you're right that all the edges have been have been, you know, softened and and figured like, out it, yeah. yeah everything everything is figured out everything has a purpose everything has a reason i i really liked this scene where she's talking to the police detective yeah and it's like it's a long scene um where like it's i think like god jody foster is so good like did you know nicole kidman almost did this role and she was actually cast to do the role and then like hurt herself and so she had to drop out and jody foster stepped up and took it over i can't I can't imagine like I love Nicole Kidman. I cannot imagine her in this role. I think this is such a powerful, like, like strong performance from Foster here that I think it's just her. It's the exact type of role she plays. Yeah, right. I mean, it's it's uh, I I don't know what else to say other than, yeah, like this is the perfect this is I, I mean, it definitely reminds me of Silence of the Lambs where it's like 
someone who is a bit uh, th- th- a bit out of her depth, but rises to the occasion and turns out to be a, a huge badass and uh, like t- turns out to have the, you know, a deep steel within her and, and, uh, mm-hmm. and, and bravery in the face of, of terrible danger. And uh, I mean, the, the, the mama bear thing is obviously a factor here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I just love her in this movie. You know, yeah. I mean, she's in really so few things that, that this is like a, one of my favorite movies of hers actually yeah it's a it's a treat it's a treat that yeah that you get to when you get to see jodie foster in performance and yeah i got distracted but going back to the the interview with the cop it's just yeah like this this back and forth like it goes from her like like seeming to have control of the situation and like revealing the very embarrassing story like i love like that's a character acting it's an actor acting with through a character acting yeah and I, I don't know i i i loved i loved it i loved the nuance of that and then the point where the cops like if you need to tell me something ma'am just nod your head or something and and she plays it off so well it's so like it's one of those things where i think it's really hard to like be believably just kind of fake if you know what i mean yeah like well, or like yeah how hard is it to act like someone who's only kind of good at acting Exactly. I, I, and I have no idea because I've never really tried to act, um, <laughs> whatsoever, <laughs> yeah. but, but like, it, it seems like it must be because I agree, like her, her character is not that good of an actor. Like she kind of overdoes it here and there. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and like, you can see her pause as she, as she thinks a few times, like how, okay, how am I going to respond to this? You know, um, right. which, which is all Jodie Foster doing like this double level thing yeah well and we see that the cop she's talking to is one of the ones that shows up after everything all the shit goes down at the end of the movie so like she definitely definitely like didn't convince him like he he left so they bought it on some level but you you think that he's like like something was sticking in his craw about this this whole situation and he just had to come back because the cops get there very very quickly at the end of this movie like not fast enough to where like the they heard something as shit went down. Like it's right. like they were there waiting. I, I agree with that. Um, and so, so speaking of that scene, I mean, there's, I guess there's a few scenes like this in the movie, but that's such a Fincher dialogue scene where the camera has so many different positions that it likes to, to, to go to like uh-huh. there, there's, there's kind of the, the medium on, on the, uh, on the, on the cop's face and then on her face through the doorway and then on her from the security camera and then on her like over her shoulder and then on the face of the other cop who's like sit standing there chewing gum. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and sort of like being <laughs> completely non-reactive in a way, which is uh, tense. Um, and, and, and how, how he'll, he'll switch to different shots kind of at different times, like um, to make you more nervous, basically like, like close up on the, on the detective's, extremely skeptical face yeah as as you really you really hope that he buys this yeah i mean it is it is just incredible how he continues to just take a dialogue scene and make it the most intense thing in the world and i mean we are quickly getting up to the the film in which he turns this skill into uh an art form that i've never seen before i think zodiac is the next movie of his we're gonna do in which has the greatest tense dialogue scene of all time and then if there's like six of them in the same movie um but i mean you can see it here in that scene you can see it just in every reaction like every scene in this movie is and and all the ones we've ever done is these like moments of tension just through how he shoots dialogue and i i just i just continue to be floored by it i just love it yeah um so, you know, there's one thing that I remember him doing in previous movies that he doesn't really do here. I don't think he did it in Fight Club either now that I think about it. What's that? But, I, but I remember us talking about it where it would be like um, kind of a quick. No, I think he did do it in Fight Club. But anyway, like 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 quick, quick, very short shots of like, like, for example, I um, mean, Alien 3 the doctor like tossing a scalpel onto a pan and it like cuts to just the, the clatter of the action. And then it cuts back to somebody's face, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and this movie, I don't, I don't think it does that, but one thing that it does do is it has this very cool way of like, um, let's say that, let's say that someone is, 
so 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 we we want the viewer to remember where this hammer ended up and so the camera is sure to take an angle where it can see conspicuously that they set down the hammer and and then lingers just like a quarter of a second longer on yeah. where the hammer is and and it does this a bunch of times because where things were left where particular objects were left around the house becomes relevant especially as you get toward the end and uh and, and he's always careful to kind of it's not an it's not in an overblown way where it's like you know z- z- you know zoom in on on the on the hammer or whatever but you you notice it at least subconsciously and then later you're you're like oh yeah the hammer was there and it and it it, it works for you um yeah it's it's kind of very specific visual storytelling that like does not yeah, it does not draw attention to the thing. It's like it's not as simple as insert shot to remind you of thing here, right. um, which he does a few of those. Like, I think when the phone slides under the bed for the first time, when uh, when what's his name, when Jared Leto, like, turns over the right. the the bed and then we see the phone slide under it. That's just an insert of being like, hey, remember, this is here. But yeah. it, he does it in much slyer ways other and other places in the movie as well. For sure. Um, just kind of uses uses depth. And uses like kind of shallow focus and times to just like it's there. It's not in the focus on the screen, but you you reminded it's there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if I just want to go through like interesting camera things that he's doing. I mean, I guess that we've been doing a lot of that so far. But another, I think one of my favorite scenes is when um, they uh, the, the three burglars are like on the stairs, kind of having a shouting argument, and she leaves the panic room to go look for the phone uh-huh. and like it, it's it's like slow motion it's, it's like yeah. like half speed or something yeah and the sound like it's not that there's no sound but it's like highly muted and and muffled and i just i love i love the progression of that and the tension of it and then the moment where she knocks over the lamp and there's like the flash of it i just it all works so beautifully I, I love that whole scene yeah and it's like uh, it's a constructed flash right it's almost like too bright like yes yeah. when you knock over a lamp there would be this this flash as the light bulb breaks but it would not be like like we we fincher cuts down to the bottom of the stairs and we're like seeing forrest whitaker's face and we can see the flash behind him and it's right. like it's like a grenade went off back there it's like it's like elevated to draw a point but it, it is it is really really effective and i think the other thing he does is yeah he he turns down all the sounds there except for like like the the lamp falling is at full volume every time she pushes the phone when she's uh-huh. trying to grasp the phone and accidentally like pushes it further away i think that's at full volume which makes those noises just like oh they kill you even more because everything's quiet except for those noises it really helps ramp up the tension um yeah, yeah i like i think slow mo is kind of just overused in general especially nowadays but this is the only part in the movie that it's used. And I thought it was just a really effective choice here. It's like, this is, I think this is really the first time she, they, she stepped outside the panic room. Right. Right. Um, and th- it makes sense that this is like her first time out of safety and, and the, the camera slows down a little bit to, to accentuate the tension there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, just more compliments about the performance, I guess, because she's so terrified at that point. Like she's, yeah, yeah. she's freaking out. She's having basically like a real, <laughs> this is how you would react reaction where you're just like, you know, th- th- thoroughly, thoroughly freaked out and, mm-hmm. um, and desperate. And over the course of the movie, like, I, I think, you know, quite a bit of time is implied to be passing here yeah. and, and she, she comes to grips with it and then gradually becomes, more in control and as she does that then um it it becomes less terrifying for her to move around the house until ultimately she's the the cat and they're the mice yeah she's literally corralling them yeah the moment where she's like locking the doors to manipulate them and and knocking out light bulbs it's so good it's so good i love it yeah you know what's funny is i i thought i uh i i remember uh um kirsten stewart i mean kristen stewart yeah um, grabbing the needles and I was like oh yeah doesn't she stab him with insulin at the end of the movie and then that just doesn't happen she stabs him with the syringes but there's no insulin in them and I was just yeah. like oh I just I just misremembered that completely so <laughs> anyway funny. yeah um, so lo- what is the name of that guy I'm trying to remember that that character I mean other Dw- Raul? It's, it's Dwight Yoakam that's who it is the actor man okay. he's so good at being like creepy and terrible well i mean that's the interesting thing about him right is like 
he he's the only one wearing a mask. He comes in and he's like the badass that shoots Jared Leto in the head. And you're like, oh, I like this guy now because uh-huh. he shoots Jared, Jared Leto in the head. Yeah. Um, and I mean, he's not an actor. I mean, he is, but he's a he's a country singer, I believe. Oh, interesting. Um, that that has done some acting in the past, but oh. I think he, he does a really good job. Yeah, I think he does a really good job too. Um, <laughs> there's there's one person in this movie. He, doesn't do a good job who's that i mean i i i I think jared leto's performance is a (laughs) bit much yeah i mean look i i i feel like i feel like the the doof media opinion on jared leto (laughs) is just generally bad um just like not a good actor um although i really did like him in um um uh what is the Requiem for a dream. Yes, Requiem for a dream. Yes, I like him in that too. But and I thought that that, suits, that meant he that was a good suit, actor. Well, I mean that suits his kind of frenetic, almost over the top style a little bit. Whereas this doesn't. Um, yeah, he, I mean he's. Yeah. I I don't know what to make of him. He's just kind of. He's the part of the movie that makes the least amount of sense to me. Um, yeah. Um. He he's very he's successfully hateable. So yeah. that's that's good. But also like. I guess it, it, to, to to your point, like you're like he can't be this stupid. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we learn right before he dies that he is the heir of the guy that um, used to live in this house. And actually, the way that the movie sets that up right in front of your face is really clever, right? When it's like the real the realtor is like talking to her in the bathroom, and it's like, oh yeah, they can't. They're missing some of their fortune, and the family right. is in a big big tizzy about trying to find the fortune. Um, and so that's like very cleverly set up, but you learn that he's part of this family and, and basically he's the black sheep of the family. And I guess I like, I get it. Like I get why you would cast someone like Leto for this role and you would like make him look the way he looked with like the, the cornrows. And yeah. I like, I get I, that is very like, that is very black sheep of the family, but that's almost why it doesn't work for me because it's very like, this is what, a writer thinks the black sheep of a family of a rich family would look like, you know? Yeah. Like I, I, yeah, I guess I, I I didn't have a huge problem with it because like he is supposed to actually be very out of touch with reality because he is from this wealthy family. And so maybe it is completely plausible that he would be this dumb and, because like the parts where they're making sort of making fun of him, they're like, did you think that we were just kind of like leave the room and let you steal all the money and then yeah. give us a tiny share? Like how, how, how did you imagine that this would actually happen? And and, then, and you're like, yeah, I mean, how did he? <laughs> yeah. Well, he didn't like, I mean, that's the whole he's, thing he's with just, the escrow too. It's like yeah. 14 days escrow. It's always business days. Right. Isn't it? <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 He's just a fucking idiot. He's a fucking idiot, but he's the rich one. He's the one who knows where the money is, and it, yeah. and, it, and, it, and it was his idea to mm-hmm. to get it. Um, I mean, yeah, I think I think that at least at least part of it is that you're meant to hate him and think he's terrible and be happy when he's dead. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, that's like that's Leto's sweet spot for sure. But yeah, I mean, I just I don't know. Like, I feel like the thing is the other two the other two guys are such strong like characters with such strong performances and they're complex. Like, like Forrest Whitaker is amazing. Um, Dwight Yoakam's character is, is much less complex. He's just pretty simply a, a a monster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I think, I think his is, is, is interesting because, um, at first you think he's like a poser because he's like, you said, he's the only one with the mask. He seems to have like a bulletproof vest on, He's mm-hmm. the only one with a gun and and Jared Leto says some things that make you think that he is just like like a LARPing, you know, <laughs> like he doesn't really know what he's doing. But but then he actually does turn out to be this cold blooded killer so that it, it has an interesting, I think, psychological effect where you don't really take him that seriously. And then suddenly he does this thing and then you take him really seriously and all the yeah. other characters are scared of him now. Yeah, but then I think also it kind of it kind of chops that down. Like when he gets his hand stuck in the thing, like I think post mask removal also does some work of really just like tearing this character down and making him seem useless a little yeah. bit. No, um, for sure. Yeah. Cause then, then he, then Forrest Whitaker stops taking, like stops being afraid of him at that point. Yeah. 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 
I do like like some of the just some of the characterization, the way Fincher characterized these people, like the the first the first thing they try is the gas and you have um, Dwight Yoakam and Forrest Whitaker like Forrest Whitaker just silently decides he's going to make this move. He doesn't say anything to anyone else. And and Raul picks up on it immediately like he gets what he's doing and starts helping and meanwhile jared leto's like what and then like way later than anyone else would have ever understood he's like oh i I see like they're literally like putting the hose into the the Uh air conditioner before leto has gotten what they're doing um that's just like a little tiny moment that i don't even know if that was in the script or not but it just it just works to characterize them Absolutely. Yeah. Um, they're, they're both competent and know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, I think that's, I think that's great because that's the kind of like nonverbal communication that you can do between competent people to signal competence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it it does make him seem formidable. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I agree. Like he's still scary at the end. Uh, I, I love the shot of him, making his way across the floor using the hammer as like a crutch. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it almost reminds me of the shining as it's like <laughs> slamming and, and like, like slam down shift, slam shift, slam. And the camera follows the, the, the hammer head in like almost, almost a jerky swing motion. Um, it's a really, that, that whole, that apart. And then like he punches Kristen Stewart and she like, Oh my God. Screams. He, he punches her right in the face. Punches her right. In the, like it's just her scream. Like I've seen this movie you know, a few times and I, I got like chills at that, at that point when she screams like that, I was like, Oh my God, that's so good. Like she, by the way, she's great in this movie. Mm -hmm. Like genuinely, genuinely, genuinely really, really good. Look, Kristen Stewart is an amazing actress and she gets a raw deal because of all the twilight stuff. Right. But she took all that money and she makes really cool shit now. So I am never going to, I'm never going to say anything bad about Kristen Stewart and the new Charlie's angels movie, which was Uh just okay. She's fucking great in it. She's hilarious. She has such good comedic timing in that movie. Kristen Stewart is awesome, and people need to stop giving her shit for Twilight. Yeah, and apparently she was awesome when she was like a preteen too. Yeah, so. I don't even actually know how old she was when this movie came out, but she had to have been like thirteen, right? She looks very young. She looks like twelve or thirteen. I agree. Yeah. I, I I I have this fantasy now that Jodie Foster like coached her in in in, in uh, has some secret huge role in her mm-hmm. in, in her becoming a good because like remember jodie foster was a was a a, a child actor as yeah, well yeah yeah um, she was uh 12 she was 12 when this movie wow. came out so um she could okay. have been she could have been like 11 been when 11. they were filming yeah wow yeah that would be that that, that sounds about right she's great i love her we need to do a, like a deconstructing Kristen stewart <laughs> We have to watch all the Twilight movies for that. No, we'll skip those. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, what else do we want to talk about this movie? I, f- I feel like we're getting to just about everything I wanted to say, but I don't know. Like I, I, I there was just so many, like, this is not my favorite Fincher movie. Um, I still think like, it's like there, there are other movies he does that just like grab me so much more. Like we're, we're doing Zodiac next and I can't fucking wait for that. That's going to be a two hour podcast. Just, just, strap in but um you know the 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 fact that this is like i mean you think about his career he does a movie like fight club which is like this big big massive movie um it's got a lot of a lot of actors a lot of moving parts it's complex and and not to say um that panic room isn't complex like i think fincher can't help himself but it kind of makes sense where he says where he looks someone comes to him with a script and says i want to scale this thing down i want to do something a little simpler but i'm gonna do it my way um and yeah. he, he makes panic room yeah well i mean it, it reminds me of how one of our um often often hosts often doof hosts michael loves movies with trains yeah and it's specifically you know because like s- s- correlationally uh a movie that's on a train is just going to have a tighter s- more streamlined and and like boiled down to its essences plot yeah because yeah. Mo- most movies involving a train are, are like forced to be linear mm-hmm. and this movie is not a train but it is like you said a bit of a bottle episode and it just forces the the script and the story and and every really every aspect of the filmmaking to just pare away so much extraneous complexity and other other things that would otherwise be involved in the storytelling and you can tell i mean it's not a long movie it's a tight simple 
concept mm-hmm. that it, and it fully explores this simple concept efficiently and at, and at good pace and and I love movies like this. I mean, I, yeah, yeah I, I don't think it's my, it, yeah, no, it's it's not my favorite Fincher movie either. But like, there's really something to be said for just like a simple, effective movie that does what it's supposed to do. Mm-hmm. No, I agree with that. I, I mean, it is one of those movies that I will watch when I see it on because it's just easy to like turn on and jump into wherever it's at and just like enjoy the story unfold in front of you. Um, it's tense in all the places it needs to be tensed. I think Hitchcockian is the, the, the best phrase for it great performances, wonderful camera lighting. Like, you know, if we're going to specifically draw some lines between the five Fincher movies we've now talked about, like the use of lighting, I think, as you talked about earlier, is really just something he's really fascinated with. Like all his movies look great. Like even, even if it looks grungy and terrible and disgusting, the look of that garbage is mwah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, no, I wish I, I, I want to understand more. I, I'm, I'm going to rephrase it from my wish to I actually want to try to learn more about the specific art of of lighting scenes yeah. and, and maybe even like film or, or the optics of how a camera collects the light and creates the image. Because there were certain scenes in this where I'm just like, I just don't actually know how they did that. Like, and, and I don't even mean anything complicated. I mean, like uh, toward the end, I was thinking this where there, the the two surviving burglars are walking Kristen Stewart down the stairs and I'm like, every, like, like, it's dark, and yet I can make out, like, the dark brown wood of the, of, of the wood floor. I can make out the bright red of her pajama pants, um, but then, like, the shadows are still dark, and, but, like, and the light sources are, like, subtle and realistic in a way where I'm just like, how do they, like, like you can't just, like, take your, you know, camera phone out into your into your house right now and and just like take a picture and have it look like that it's it's it, yeah it, 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 it's a lot of a lot of um choices are being made to make it come out the way it comes out and i and i want to understand more how they're doing that yeah i mean i am by no means an expert but i've read a lot about cameras and lighting and and yeah it's it's a combination of you know just the science and the art of understanding lights and how lights interact with cameras and what lenses to use and what focal lengths to use and, and how, what the the aperture and, and, and a lot of it, like this is 2002. I don't know how much of this like color correction is done digitally in this year, but I mean, there is a lot of work in post done on the film to kind of, you know, change the color. Um, especially if you shoot on digital, I doubt this was digital because 2002 is, I think a little early for that. Um, and it wouldn't have looked so if you shoot a movie on digital in 2002, it's not going to look this good. Right. But, um, yeah, I mean it, 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 like cinematography is, is so fascinating and I, I will never understand the, like the mind that it takes to like see these things and being like, okay, I need this shot and I want this feel how do you position lights to make that happen? And someone will just be like, okay, here at this level, I need to turn this down a little bit and just put, use this lens. And it's just, it's fascinating. It really is fascinating. Yeah. Um, I guess one, one sort of last comment on that is, uh, uh, speaking of Hitchcocky and I'm pretty sure that the, um, the final shot of the movie is a Hitchcock zoom or a, a dolly zoom. Um, because they, uh, uh, mother and daughter are sitting on the bench and they th- their size in the frame actually remains perfectly the same but like the the scene around them like warps outward very slowly mm-hmm. so i think what they're doing is they're basically doing a dolly zoom but they're doing it ju- they're just holding it at the right distance so that they stay the same in the frame I, i'm not or, or 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 maybe they're only doing um no, they have to be doing so, both so, aspects of it. Yeah. So what you do is you push in. Yeah. With like with the you, camera, like you, the camera is physically moving closer to them, but as you do that, you're adjusting the focal length of the lens, and so they are staying in constant even as the background is is rushing in. Yeah. Uh, there's a term for that, and I can't I, remember. what Well, it is. it's 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 a Hitchcock zoom or a dolly zoom. Yeah. Um, I I forget. I mean, it's either one really, but but it, it absolutely is that. It's just it, it's I've never seen it done that way before where. Or, or or the vertigo effect. Um, mm-hmm. I've seen it called different things, but like yeah. the the interesting thing is usually the effect that you get on that is you are zooming in on 
like an actor's face or something but yeah. then the background is like whooshing outward and it's a it's a disorienting effect in this one though the subject which is them stays exactly the same size um i, I don't know I, I, other than being interesting um I, I don't know if i have a point with this it's mm-hmm. just uh it's something i noticed yeah well i mean i think in a normal dolly zoom which you are correct that is the term like you are zooming in as you are pushing in and then so it, it like elevates but it feels like to me here what they're doing is they're zooming out as they're pushing in uh-huh. you know what i mean yeah no i think so, i think that's right so that's why they stay constant in in the frame i think that's exactly what they're doing yeah um it's really cool it's really cool yeah, yeah. i mean it, it it's definitely subtle like the thing about that hitchcock's like the vertigo thing is it's like not subtle in any way like it's it's screaming style right. um it's it's like they managed to create a vertigo effect using a, a lens it's fascinating but yeah it's not it's not that but it is something really cool yeah i honestly i didn't even catch that but as soon as you started talking about it i was like oh yeah you're right you're totally right yeah, I mean, I basically just finished watching it and was like, "Yeah, that's uh, that's that's interesting. Got to mm-hmm. got to talk about that." Yeah, um, I mean, it's it's one one kind of crazy thing about Fincher is he's so, um, uh, he has such a characteristic style, and yet it's never ever distracting. Like like sometimes people will use the word mannered to describe the way a director directs. And they'll be like, oh, yes, it's a good movie, but he's 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 very mannered. And it's almost <laughs> like a backhanded compliment where it's like, yeah, it's almost like sort of an eye rolling. Like, yeah, you can really tell that this was directed by so and so because it's it's just like it's almost rubbing his stylistic whatever in your face. And it's like everything Fincher's doing, it, it is stylistic, but it's stylistic in that the style is just like perfectly efficiently drawing your attention to the right things without really drawing attention to itself and um like even even like the crazy stuff in fight club like where the camera's like zooming through buildings and crazy stuff like that you're not you're it 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 works with the movie rather than being like look at how look at how stylistic i'm being um i don't know i i i don't really i don't know i don't know what my point is other than that he makes it all work for him so well yeah no i i mean I, I get what you mean. Like the, it is, it's just, there are directors that call attention to themselves and there are directors that don't call attention to themselves. And, and I think like, I don't know. I don't know if Fincher's won a, a best directing Oscar. I don't think so. Um, let okay. me check before I say this. Cause it, I think social network might've been, he was nominated for social network and he was nominated for uh, Benjamin button, but he's never won. And I think one of the reasons he's never won is because it's, you know, like we talked about with Amy Adams and that she doesn't win Academy Awards because her performances are quiet and, and it's just the way she acts is not like drawing attention to itself and screaming to itself, but it's just very, she's very talented, quiet performances. I think he's a very talented, quiet director that just does a really good job and makes really good movies, but is not like, this is David Fincher. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, and I love it. I do, too. I really do. Um, and his best movie is still to come. So I am excited. Me too. Can't I can't wait. Like I, I watch Zodiac like twice a year just, just because I'd like to study that movie. So getting to study it for a podcast is like my, my dream. Well, good. I haven't watched it in a while, so this will be good. Yeah. You're not allowed to hate it by the way. Oh, I mean, just, I've seen it before. I, I, I like it. Okay, good. No risk just, of that. Just making sure. Cause you never know, Matt. You it would be know. really interesting if I did though. Yeah. Hey, I watched it this time and uh, I hate it. Well, it's it's interesting because like the structure of that movie is so very different from like anything. Right. Like it's such a weird movie. <laughs> it's so strange. Yeah. No, I mean, story like script wise, storytelling yeah, wise, yeah. You're, you're like, what what is this? What is the story of this movie? Right. Like, it, that's it what's funny. It almost doesn't have one. Yeah. It, that's almost it's almost the sort of like no country for old men esque thing where you walk away from it and you're like, what the hell was the point of that? And, and, <laughs> and, and it's, and, and that's the reaction you're kind of supposed to have and, sure, and, and sure. then, and then process that. Um, um, I, I mean, it honestly, it, that movie, uh, Zodiac probably has more of a, of a, of a resolution than, than no country does, but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like I mean, both of those it's, though. It's like a, 
yeah well we, we'll talk about it <laughs> um so yeah we're gonna be doing um zodiac next there are, i believe there are 10 films in this marathon and we've just fil- finished film number five so we're halfway through the films of david fincher already matt it's exciting awesome can't wait to uh move on yeah me too so we'll be back um in a few weeks with zodiac and that's all we had this week with panic room so if you have any opinions on panic room yourself if you watched it for this episode or you just have seen it and just don't agree with us you want to talk about it you saw something we didn't see you can reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail.com or over on our twitter account at doofmedia yeah and if you're not already subscribed to this podcast um we encourage you to do so and ensure you never miss an episode you can find us on itunes stitcher youtube google play and pretty much anywhere you can listen to podcasts and you can find this and all of our shows over at our website doofmedia.com and matt there's something special happening less than 24 hours from from right now when we're recording and today the day you're listening well it's a it's a little thing called all packed up tell me about what that is it's a 24 hour live stream put on by our friends elliot and ruben from the deep impact podcast a podcast going through wild bows packed chapter by chapter they finished it they are finishing it tomorrow and to celebrate they're gonna stream just them talking for 24 hours. They're going to be talking all about Wild Bows Pact. Um, they're going to have special guests, including you and me. And, of course, the author of that book, Wild Bow, will be joining them on Saturday to talk about the book for a little bit, which is just crazy. Yeah, they've got a full schedule of uh, fun activities uh, throughout that 24-hour period. Um it's, it's probably some kind of mental breakdown at some point in there. Oh, yeah. yeah I think um, actually that they've got the mental breakdown scheduled at about hour 22. That so. sounds about right to me. Yeah. Um, but we'll we'll link the calendar in the show notes so that you can check that out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and of course, they are doing this not just because it's fun. They are raising money for a homelessness charity uh, based out of Australia. So they're going to be accepting donations all during that 24 hours. And all, every single bit you donate uh, will go towards that charity. And it will be over. You, you'll see this all in the, the schedule that we're going to link, but it will be over on our Twitch page, which is twitch.tv slash So um, whether you've read Pact, I mean, there'll be definitely be spoilers for Pact. If you haven't read that book, but that's okay. You can still donate at least just hop in, say, hi, love what you guys are doing. Here's five bucks. That's what you can do. Um, I'm sure it would mean the world to them and, and you'll get to see us cause we'll be there for some of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, we're, I guess we probably will be doing a bit of packed spoiling, but yeah, I mean, what, our segment is like a three hour segment tomorrow evening, um, where we're going to be playing a tabletop RPG based on the fate system. Um, set in the world of pact so like i think there'll be some like some spoilers that like come off of that but not like specific th- to the book spoilers you know what i mean like More it'll like spoil some of the world yeah, yeah yeah um so if you've never read pact but just want to see us goof around with dice for <laughs> a couple hours you can do that yeah i think that'd be fine yeah i agree I cool agree. all right um and if you want to support us donate to deep impact or donate to all packed up absolutely but also you can maybe donate to us and you can find us on our patreon account that's patreon.com slash doof media you can pledge just just a measly dollar which gives you access to our doof media discord as well as voting in a, in a bunch of different stuff our, our fan art cost to contests our uh, book clubs um all kinds of stuff we it's 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 a it's our introductory level and i think you get a lot of a lot of bang for that buck matt that's right. If you if you stole twenty million dollars in bear bonds, um, just one dollar. What's one dollar to you, huh? Uh, Matt, did you die a little bit inside when he had to open his hand and all those millions of dollars just it just put it away? I did. That was the that was the saddest part. Ugh. I know. You think one of those cops just like grabbed one? And... I hope so. I hope somebody did. Hey, like, I I know we're in the outro and this is a complete tangent, <laughs> but like, if you show up at like with a, a million dollar bear bond in your hand. Like surely someone's going to ask questions about that, right? I, I feel like movies use bear bonds as if they are just magic. Like, <laughs> because the, the same thing in mission impossible, it was just like, Oh yeah. Bear bonds. Yeah. Those are untraceable. R- really? <laughs> like how many of those are there even? It's got to have a number on it. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're definitely yeah. going to be able to trace it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like, All I don't right. think you can just walk into a bank and just be like, 
I am bearing this. I, I feel like movies just need to have the conceit of like, look, we need a piece of paper that is worth a lot. Sure, sure. Let's fair. just pretend bearer bonds work that way. You're just going to have a single piece of paper that's worth a million dollars. Yeah, yeah right. fair. Anyway, let's finish the show. Yeah, so please consider rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts. You can explain what bearer bonds are in your review. Every review, review helps us get more exposure and introduces new people to the content that we make here. All right. We will see you guys next week when we are. Ooh, Matt, I'm, I'm excited about this one. Next week, we are going to be doing an episode on the Super Mario Brothers movie. Yes. <laughs> yes, that one. That uh, movie. The best movie of all time. Oh, I can't wait. I cannot wait. So we'll see you next week when we're talking about Super Mario. <laughs>